talking to me. There's something awakening in my mind. I can't control it. What did you see? There's a crusade coming. Do you often dream things that happen just as you dream them? Yes. The test is simple. Remove your hand from the box, and you die. What's in the box? Pain. You inherit too much power. You have proven you can rule yourself. Now you must learn to rule others. Something none of your ancestors learned. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. My Lord Duke. Where the fear is gone. Only I will remain. Go, go, go! Talk about the effective way in which sound was used to place viewers on Arrakis and in the world of Denis Villeneuve's Dune. Today's guests are supervising sound editors Mark Mangini and Theo Green, and re-recording mixers Doug Hempel and Ron Bartlett. The veteran sound team was Oscar-nominated for Villeneuve's prior film, Blade Runner 2049. Mark Mangini previously won an Oscar for Mad Max Fury Road and Hemphill for The Last of the Mohicans. I'm Carolyn Jardina. Welcome to The Hollywood Reporter's Behind the Screen. Welcome. Good to talk with all of you again. Great to be here. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. So why don't I let each of you introduce yourselves? Uh, Theo, would you like to start? Hi, I'm Theo Green, uh, sound designer and supervising sound editor on Dune. Hi, this is Mark Mangini, supervising sound editor and sound designer for Dune. This is Ron Bartlett, and I'm a re-recording mixer, and I mix the dialogue and music on Dune. This is Doug Hemphill, uh, sound effects mixer on Dune. Okay, let's get started. Would one of you, uh, Mark, you'd like to start, um, describe the sonic approach to the film that was discussed with Denny? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, because I, th I think we've done something really lovely and maybe a little bit unusual for science fiction. Um, Denis' uh, approach, well, let me back up by say, saying that early on, Theo and I met with Denis and our film editor, Joe Walker, to talk uh, conceptually about the project. You know, what... What do they want the film to sound like? And, and our marching orders were based around delivering a very organic, believable uh, soundtrack, which is to say, traditionally, science fiction um, is replete with fantastical sounds and, and um, you know, heightened uh, kind of uh, grab your ear kind of sounds. And Denis wanted to really focus this in the realm of something that you might hear if you actually put a boom mic out and you were there on Arrakis recording worms and, and uh, spice crawlers, for example. So it was really a, a, a wise way to frame Theo's and, and my design approach when we made things so that we understood the kind of universe these sounds had to live in. And to that end, we began recording sounds in the desert, for example, for many of the fantastical elements like worms bur burrowing under the, sa the sand and and the, the sand thumper, um, items like that. So it, it all started with uh, a guiding aesthetic from Denis. 
Mac Ruth was your production sound mixer. And Theo, I believe you were also in Budapest during production. Would you tell us a little bit about some of that early work? Sure, yes. So um, something which I did on Blade Runner 2049 as well was, uh, and this is really an idea that came from Denis and Joe Walker, uh, his editor, um, was when you're working with a world that contains many sounds that don't exist in our own world, it, it becomes much harder for an editor to put together a scene um, to screen it for the director or the producers unless he has the sounds, at least the first version of a sound for some of those fantastical things like an ornithopter or a shield or a worm. Um, and on Dune, I think um, I started with, actually I started with something very, very everyday, like a fight. Um, um, but the second thing I worked on was the big worm chase. And, and that was something where you know, we all knew that that was going to be a key moment in the film and Denis wanted to see what that was going to look like even before the, the VFX were complete. Um, like many of the things that Denis makes, he does a, a hell of a lot of stuff practically. A lot of the effects and the imagery is in camera and often, um, you know, VFX are really just adjusting a few things or adding a few elements. So the idea was for me to go out there um, and all the time communicating with Mark Mangini to send... Um, you know, I was kind of like a, uh, what do you call it? Like an early scout party going to, going to sort of figure out what the, the lay of the land was going to be. Um, and then we were able to communicate and sort of discuss what sort of resources we thought were going to be needed as we, as we went further along. But really the key reason for, um, starting that early is to start the conversation between, you know, whilst the film is still being shot and in some cases the script is still being revised, um, we get a chance, Mark and I um, get a chance to send certain ideas of how something might work, how the voice might work, for instance, how the voice inside someone's head might work. And things like that can uh, give the director and the editor something to grab onto when they're trying to figure out how to um, edit a scene, whether it's going to be purely interior in a character's mind, whether some piece of information is going to be dropped to us via something that Paul hears in a vision or... Um, so that collaborative approach is something that Denis has encouraged, um, right from the first moment that Doug, Ron, Mark, and I started working together, um, bringing us on early, starting the, the cross talk just between ourselves, between us and, uh, his editor, between his editor and the VFX department. Um, and we'll get into some granular details, I'm sure, but you know, there are, there are multiple sound design uh, pieces in the film that uh, were developed very much in cohort with Joe Walker's editing process, very much in collaboration with the VFX team. Um, and I kind of don't know how we would have arrived at the result that we got if we tried to do it any other way. So I'm very glad that that was Denise's method. You mentioned voices. The first clip we're going to listen to is Charlotte Ramping's voice. Uh, would one of you like to introduce that? Sure. Um, well, it's, I mean, there are multi, uh, all of us kind of fed ideas into this right from the start. Uh, again, I think, you know, how, how we are going to approach this voice, which, you know, it, it may in some ways seem to be the most supernatural element of, of Dune. That is that someone can use uh, some facet of their voice to command people and, and it enters their head and makes them do whatever the person commands. Um, going back to the book, it's really, not meant to be a supernatural power. The Bene Gesserit are a highly trained order who have learned all kinds of sort of, um, you know, uh, um, meditation tricks and, and have harnessed the power of the human mind to its full potential. I guess that was, that was Frank Herbert's idea. So one of the things that Mark Mangini and I first batted around in conversation with Denis was when someone uses this voice, instead of it just being a computerized effect or some sort of, you know, a plugin that we put on to make it sound different, what if we had a sense that the user of the voice is channeling some ancient ancestral uh, memory that in some way when they use the voice, we have the full power of their entire family tree of Bene Gesserit ancestors? We did tests way early on, the three of us. It was Mark, Theo, and me. And we didn't really listen to each other's uh, attempts 
just to see if we could come up with very, very different ideas. So we all put those together and, and played them for Denis and Joe. And I'd say most of them got tossed, you know, which is, uh, it's humbling, but it's also a great journey to go on because now it's like, okay, we've, we heard all the stuff that you would normally do and you'd normally think of, push it, push the limit, see what you can come up with, make it unique, you know? So that really made us stretch and dig deep and find something cool. You dismissed my mother in her own house. Come here, Neil. So the next clip we have is the shield training. Doug, would you like to introduce that one? <laughs> well, I think that would be better served with, with Theo, actually. Uh, that's his baby. Well, I mean, like all of these things, um, we might have we might have started the baby off and then Doug and Ron come in and give the baby the full education and bring them up to the, you know, I don't know how to describe that better, but it, it is always a, a, a team effort to make these things work and to make them believable, to make them feel like they're there in the room, you know. Uh, so it was something that I kicked off with uh, um, a recording of a machine gun, <laughs> strangely enough. I just wanted something that had a, a kind of repetitive impact with enough processing and taking off everything except for a sort of throbbing bass I then used a technique called granular synthesis, which is the sound design equivalent of a VFX particle engine. It's something that allows you to shatter a sound into thousands of pieces and then manipulate those pieces as a cloud. Um, and some settings went wrong as I was playing with it. There are a few settings which really kind of make it painful to listen to. And um, it wasn't until the sound started getting painful and clicking and actually glitching and doing stuff that it's not supposed to do that Denis responded to it. Um, and, and, and said that that sounds like a, a, a dangerous, you know, a dangerous weapon, something that's able to repel a dangerous weapon and also something that's vulnerable because in the, in, in, in the book and in the film, the shields are universal. They're used by everybody. Every culture has a shield. Every spaceship has a shield. And yet they've also developed ways to penetrate the shields, um, on a body. It's with a slow blade. Um, we also see other ways of penetrating a shield elsewhere in the film. But here is an example of um, the shield in the training scene where Paul um, is trained how to use the shield and swords by Gurney Halleck. penetrates the shield. One of the real beauties of Theo's design of the shields, at least the personal shields, is that it follows this, this notion that is informed by those early discussions with Denis and Joe that we make a believable science fiction universe. And Theo and I had set about early on to try not to fall prey to science fiction audio tropes. So as you can imagine in science fiction films, in the past, we've seen uh, shields or you know force fields, and that's um, visually represented by some kind of glowing orange or yellow or blue cocoon that surrounds a person or a spaceship. And we desperately wanted to avoid that trope, not only visually, but sonically. So Theo actually came up with this really brilliant idea as we kind of puzzled through it that perhaps the, the shield really only presents itself when it needs to, when it's either either protecting the occupant or it's being breached. And that became, again, another beautiful back and forth with VFX where we created these short little duration, sparky, staticky, granular things. And VFX would hear that and <laughs> animate to it. And then they'd add something to that. That would then go come back from Joe Walker back to us. And we, we would then attend to those refinements. And there was always this beautiful, organic, symbiotic process of creation. For the scenes set on the harsh desert planet of Arrakis, you recorded quite a bit in Death Valley. Would you tell us about um, your actually adventures? You buried mics in the sand. You did all sorts of things. Hey, Theo, is, is Mad Dogs an Englishman <laughs> somewhere appropriate in here about being out in the noonday sun in uh, Death Valley in, you know, 100 degree heat? Nonetheless, 
Uh, Theo and I and Charlie Campagna and Eric Basta trekked up the dunes uh, for an entire day with a lot of recording equipment and microphones to capture everything that we could capture uh, or that was available to us out in the desert. So that included really simple and fundamental things like footstep sounds, walking in deep sand. Now, normally those kinds of sounds would be captured in a recording studio, maybe a fully stage, but the desert has a very, very unique powdery kind of sand that we couldn't find anywhere. And so we felt as though we needed to create uh, a library of, of very deep sand sweeteners that would augment the Foley that we would do with Andy Malcolm, who, who ended up himself bringing in a dump truck's worth of sand to his recording studio, literally a mountain of sand outside his studio, so that he could realize uh, the beauty of, of walking in the desert. And then we proceeded to uh, gather raw elements for things like the thumper and the worms furrowing. So we brought mallet and hammers and we beat on the sand and we buried hydrophones, the kind of microphone you would drop underwater to capture underwater sounds like whale sounds. And we put those under the sand to capture this very resonant signature of the sand in Death Valley. It was one of the things that actually triggered our, um, our journeys to Death Valley was hearing these recordings that Doug Hempel had made, these beautiful, you know, singing sand dunes. Um, there's this deep moaning, groaning sound that a sand dune makes all, all by itself, just sitting there in the desert as the sands shift and move. Um, and they do that because they are completely resonant. They're, they're like the body of a musical instrument. If you, if you tap on one side of a sand dune and record on the other, you'll hear it. Um, you'll hear it resonating through and they, you know, they even resonate on their own. They're so resonant. So having heard those amazing recordings, which by the way, we used extensively in, in the desert scenes of, of Dune, um, we decided that we wanted to explore those resonant properties of sand dunes. And, and that really meant, yeah, sticking all kinds of microphones and hydrophones deep under the sand whilst recording above the sand at the same time so that we could kind of shift our perspective and create this, uh, sound that sounds kind of like a drum skin and you know Frank Herbert had described in the book and and it was an important part of the script that if you stand on the wrong kind of sand on Arrakis um, it's so resonant that it's like a drum and they call it drum sand um, and th that's uh, something that precedes a, a, a um, you know that that basically calls the worm it, it's um, the sound of resonating sand is is like a allure to the sandworm. So it's something that all of the natives in Arrakis have learned to avoid. So, you know, it's a, a real plot point. Close by. Let's get out of here. Right. Peace from sand. Run! Doug had a, a really beautiful observation while we were mixing that would inform our use of sound for the desert. And that was as he is mixing and using these sounds that we recorded out in the desert, he noticed that visually the, 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 the shots of sand being furrowed and roiling as the worm is approaching or, or coming towards the camera resembled surf. And as we struggled to differentiate all these sand sounds, Doug said to me, Mark, get, get some waves crashing. Get me some, some surf on the beach sounds. It, what we're looking at looks just like what I see when I go to the beach. And indeed, the, the, the spice, if you will, the secret sauce to many of our big sand moments, which were hard to, you know, 
Theo and I couldn't move a sand dune out in the desert, but by adding these bigger than life surf sounds at Doug's, uh, um, uh, from Doug's observations, it all of a sudden brought to life these huge movements of sand that we were seeing on screen. Can I, I will add to what Mark said really quickly. The, the genesis of that was um, I viewed Dune, the desert uh, world in Dune, as something that was actually very beautiful. And I got the feeling that Fremen felt the same way uh, that I did. So when I was looking at these lovely images uh, in the film of sand moving, it just is one of those things that just struck me about the beauty of waves and, and movement and whatnot, uh, the elegance of that. And Mark and Theo executed that wonderfully. So that's that was the genesis of that. Our next clip is the crackling spice hallucination. You know, this is a feel thing, what we do. And, and we get all this material. Some of it's fully realized. Uh, we get the music, and, but then we start bouncing ideas off each other when we mix and, uh, and put it all together. And we came up with a sort of a, a filter sweep on Paul's vision, uh, which just sort of happened. It was like, let's try this. And we do that a lot. We all trust each other. We all respect each other. So we just tried an experiment with a filter sweep where Paul goes into his uh, vision and, you know, I, I really loved it. And it, it didn't change much after we first did it. And then uh, my partner was at a screening uh, watching the movie and some guy behind her said, what, did he go deaf? Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, a lot, you know, In the words of Bugs Bunny, what a maroon. <laughs> yeah, there, there's always one guy out there that'll just pot, deflate your uh, creativity, but... Uh, yeah, that, that was one of the things I was most happy with is that sequence. I, I thought it turned out very, very well, in, in combining everything, music, dialogue, uh, sound design. I thought it, we pulled it off very well. So I'm happy with it, despite that guy's comment. <laughs> it's fundamentally, uh, you know, there's, there's a sort of psychedelic quality to um, the movie. And, and, and at least there's, you know, there's the psychedelic experience is certainly something that's fundamental to Frank Herbert's writing and, um, you know, obviously a universe that's based around a substance like spice um, that alters the mind and brings visions, etc. It was very important to um, be able to summon something that really made you feel as if you'd gone inside someone's head at that moment. I think that filter sweep that Doug describes has that effect of, you know, you've, you've been experiencing the, the din of all of these machines and the sand and the desert, and then suddenly... Whew, you're right inside someone's head. And yes, someone could think he's gone deaf or, or you know, something, something has, has just blindsided him and hit him and he's in a completely different space, which is kind of more what we were hoping someone would feel. Um, but it's, it's one of those moments where we have kind of sand swirling around him, but it's peppered with these little kind of, actually one of the very few synthetic things that are um, in the sound. And, and that's these tiny little synthesized kind of granules um, that give a sense of a, a presence of a supernatural grit or something like that. That's an important mo moment in the film sonically because after having developed this idea that deploying the voice summons your the, the power of your ancestors, Denis latched onto that and saw a huge narrative uh, blessing and that we started using that ancient voice even in those spice hallucinations where the ancient voice was talking to Paul. We, we sort of freed it from the confines of just being part of the voice and used it as a narrative tool. That's one of the best things about that scene is the dynamics. It's easy to play a scene like that where just everything's, you know, the storm's blaring, the sound effects are going, the music's big, everything's going all the time. But we tend to really rack focus on certain sounds and tell you where we want you to listen. It has so many different elements. 
And it really takes you through the story saying, oh, now we're in his head. Oh, he's hearing, you know, ancient voices swirling around. And then we come right back to a giant worm explosion. And, you know, it's it's exciting, but it it, it would be just a, a gray melange, if you will, of, of stuff. <laughs> and it wouldn't be very interesting unless you did that and you really chose each sound of when it played. That's the thing I've really learned working with Ron and Doug. I think, you know, Mark and I often provide a huge sandwich of possibilities. Um, and it's, it's, it's Ron and Doug's experience at storytelling with sound that is able to, as he says, rack focus, tell us what to listen to at any one particular moment. Um, and, and that's absolutely their genius is, is knowing that the, the thing you want to focus on at any particular moment is the thing that's telling the story. You started quite early on this. Um, was this more so than usual? Theo was the first guy on the on the sound team to start. Yeah, but um, at the same time, I remember the very first scene that I cut. I, I sent to Mark, who was who was back in LA, and you know we were we the dialogue had already very much started. Um, but um, you know, we, it, the great thing was that on on this film, as opposed to Blade Runner twenty forty nine, we all knew that we were going to be working together from from day one. So we were able to sort of ping each other questions, sounds like Doug was able to ping us his amazing sand dune recordings. Um, I was able to send the very first scenes of the worm that I was seeing to, to Mark. Um, Ron was able to contribute his very first ideas of how the voice might sound. So more so than ever before, we were able to kind of spin ideas between us right from the very get go. And I trust you're getting the band back together again for the sequel that's now been announced. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, th I think we need to give a shout out to Denis again, because this doesn't happen without the support of a director, a visionary director who recognizes that sound is not a post-production process. Sound is a filmmaking process. And in so doing, he budgets and supports and schedules sound being an interactive part of production and and editing and post. And we, we, couldn't, we couldn't achieve these things without a director who remembers when he was a film student and making his first feature film and was only given sound for three weeks at the end after the edit was done and locked and VFX were done. Sound was something that was applied later like a bath at the lab. And he recognizes that it's so much more organic than that. I wanted to also talk about your collaboration with Hans Zimmer. Uh, Ron, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, I've I've mixed a lot of scores for Hans over the years, and we both have a very high mutual respect for each other, and and uh, love his work, and and know all of his guys. You know the Alan Meyerson, everybody, and on his crew, um, and Ryan. But uh, you know, we we did talk uh, much earlier on this one because he is so passionate about this movie. I mean, he he read the book as I did in high school, uh, maybe earlier for him, but he knows every single thing about the book. So he was very passionate about jumping in on this one. Uh, and he spoke to Denis very early on, like I think it was right after Blade Runner, we were all kind of talking about the next thing. And uh, that's when he was talking to Hans about it. So uh, all of us were really excited about it. And then hearing what he had planned and he was coming up with all these new instruments that he was designing. And, uh, he found this beautiful, uh, vocalist, uh, Loire, who is very prominent in the movie. And, and she really, for me, carries the soul of that track in, in so many cues. Uh, and it's just a wonderful voice that he's added in there. Um, and he has this, you know, a lot of the same players that he uses on other, films but it's approached in a very unique way and then i know that uh, theo could comment on this that uh, he talked to hans a lot early on about sounds and the approach and how they would all fit together well yeah i mean again and and, and um you know credit due to denis for making something which is often talked about that is you know collaboration between sound and, and music um, actually happen um Sometimes it seems you really need to twist arms to make something like that happen. Um, it's always an intention I've heard so many people talk about, and, and yet we have our own ways of working, we have our own teams. It, it, it tends to be that a composer doesn't want someone to hear their work until it's actually presentable, you know? So it was, it was um, unusual and definitely kind of um, spurred on by Denis that Hans was sending us examples of the instruments that he was developing, examples of the percussion that he'd been recording, examples of the vocals. 
not yet fully formed cues at, at the beginning, but more just the tonalities, more of the textures. Um, and that in, in turn helped us know which direction he was going in. And we did the same thing. We would send him any scene that was, you know, clearly going to be led by sound, like the sand thumper or um, or the running on drum sand or something where we knew that his music would be featuring big, but we also had a sound that was going to, you know, tell the story. We would send him those sounds so that he would know, I guess, how to keep out of the way of certain sounds, and we would know how to keep it out of the way of certain instruments that he was using. And that kind of... So there's there's two things that that enables. It's a kind of sonic dovetailing so that, um, you know, we can hand off a scene to him. A gom, the Gom Jabbar sequence is a good example of that, where um, Paul is being tested and tortured by um, Reverend Mother Mohayam, and we build up a whole load of sort of pain sounds, dentist drills, stuff that just goes inside Paul's head again and describes his pain. And then there's a moment where Paul conquers the pain and a big shift happens, a really noticeable change. And that's the moment at which Hans's score starts to really come out. And so there are these sort of handoffs, um, I would call them really, that, that uh, it really helps if you've had a bit of time to pre-plan those things. And then there's also just what we call sort of fighting frequency, something where we've done something very screechy and trebly and Hans was planning to do the same thing. So again, having a, um, a window into each other's working process enabled us to um, integrate our worlds much more effectively so that it doesn't all come as a big surprise when the final mix happens and, and the final cues are delivered. We had some kind of a advance warning of what was coming and likewise the other way. We have two more clips that I'm going to play. I'd like to focus on the sound design for these. Um, the first is the ornithopter in the sandstorm. Um, Mark, do you want to introduce that one? One of the big challenges in a sequence that um, was as discussed with Denis, uh, Denis really wanted this to be like the big sound moment. And he had made very clear, as he does in, in every film, Score will not be here. Sound has to really care, do all the heavy lifting. I want this to be massive and I want it to feel like a 700 kilometer per hour gale that no one could survive. So it was going to be a sonic assault. And I've done a lot of storm like sequences in the past and it all ends up feeling like white noise. The sounds of wind and sand and debris are very, very grating sounds. So for me, the, the secret sauce in this sequence is was that when we are outside the ship, number one, um, I created a series of microtonal uh, choral uh, pieces that give it it almost like a uh, a singing quality, almost like the, the 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 storm itself is alive, and that gave it color that it would not have had were it the white noisy kinds of wind sounds that you normally get in a sequence like this. The other way to make that sequence play better was to contrast interior exterior. We're outside, it's, it's full bore. Um, we're using every speaker. And when you cut into the side of the ornithopter, you have a dramatic shift in level so that you're always getting this dynamic wave so that your ear isn't assaulted for you know, 45 seconds or a minute ongoing. Above 5,000 meters. And you also brought the worm encounter. Oh, that the, the worm encounter is, is, is a great one. Um, the worm, the worm encounter is is, a, is an interesting moment for sound design because um, Theo and I, our initial efforts were met with failure. We we as as I guess anyone might do began that 
voicing of the worm, the reveal of the worm, when it breaches out of the sand and presents itself and arguably speaks for the first time, uh, we went in the direction of a giant frightening creature. And our early designs, uh, which were all resoundingly um, thrown out, were big monster-like roars. What we didn't know, we found out very quickly from Denis, was that this was not meant to be a moment of terror, but a moment of reverence. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the worm is like a god on Arrakis. And we had to literally retool everything and go in a completely different direction, ending up with what we call the gunk, gunk, gunks. That's the sound that the, the worm vocalizes when it's finally revealed and attempts to, to, to perhaps even communicate with Paul and Jessica. Dave Whitehead ended up finding the secret sauce to the vocal component of, of the worm. And he, what he told me was that it was made out of some heavily processed whale sounds. And I, I don't know what kind of whale that was and what he did to render them, but he, he very cleverly created a rhythmic pattern to them that mimicked the thumper because we, we thought there is this symbiosis between the thump, is the thumper mimicking the worm or is the worm mimicking the thumper? After thousands of years of coexistence, we don't know if it's a chicken and egg problem here, which, which came first, the thumper or the, or the whale voice, but he very cleverly intuited that and it, cre it creates this lovely sonic connection between the, between the two. It's a thumper. Someone set off a thumper. When you were coming up with some of these sounds, were there any um, movies or TV shows or anything that you referenced or that you watched for inspiration? No, I mean, I think that's one of the things I, I personally keep away from watching other movies. And I think Denis is someone who's always pointed us towards, you know, um, like a scientist, re research the physics of real world things that come as close as possible to what you're, what you're trying to create. Um, one thing he never does is, to, to, to reference uh, another movie, um, which is somewhat different to other directors I've worked with who often kind of have something in mind they've seen in another movie. Um, so, no, we were really, you know, one of the things that we saw in, in the early visuals that made us um, create a certain kind of sound was those whale-like kind of baleen teeth that, that surround the mouth, the mouth of the worm. Um, and Denis' note was... This is the driest organism on the driest planet you, you can ever imagine. So the one thing that we don't want to hear is any kind of, you know, stomach gurgles or sort of gross slurping sounds. It, it's it's a, as dry as can be and actually focus on the air moving through those teeth, focus on the sand dripping out of the teeth. And those are the kind of details that we went with. I mean, initially, the very, very, very first pass that I made on that, um, which was in Budapest, it was almost silent. Um, I remember playing that to Mark and I think maybe even Doug heard it at that point as well. I can't remember, but um, I think everyone felt a little underwhelmed. We we need something there. It can't just rear up and do nothing. Um, and while we we tried and failed with some, you know, monster godzilla -y kind of things, um, it, it was it was that gunk, gunk, gunk that was the defining thing. It felt like it comes from deep down inside a long tube. Um so yeah, always thinking about the physical properties of things. That's kind of that's the best cueing for the sounds, rather than things that we've seen in other movies. Every now and then, I'll check something to make sure that we're not doing something that some, someone else has done in another film. And of course, because there is a David Lynch version of the book, which is very very different, there are a couple of times where I was just like, I better check her, look it up on YouTube and check that scene. And it's like, okay, phew, they did something completely different. <laughs> we can move on. <laughs> You know, Theo, that that was uh, that was an interesting way we mixed that scene because uh, we got the music and it was it was you know very big and intense, 
And as Paul and Jessica are running, I don't know if you guys remember this, to, to get away from the worm, we said, well, wait a minute. We can get those sand drum footsteps in there, too. It, does, it doesn't have to just be music. And I remember uh, we all said, yeah, let's play those feet up. And the feet kind of integrate nicely with the music in there. And that's an example of how we kind of slid under some big score to get some of our, our sounds in there. Exactly. The feet, feet are like the percussion of that track. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, there's a funny story, and if you don't mind us telling it, uh, we have a chamber of silence uh, in the film, which was originally called the cone of silence. <laughs> and Denis and Joe had no idea that in Get Smart, they had a cone of silence. So we changed some of the dialogue to get rid of that so that audience members who are, say, as old as me and remember Get Smart uh, wouldn't, wouldn't put that together. What are some of the more surprising sounds that you recorded and incorporated into the film? Well, um, one weekend, Joe Walker was perusing YouTube and came across a beautiful nature video of a family, an abandoned family of baby red squirrels. And he sent it to me and it was the most charming and cute sounds. And he said, do you think this could work for the Muad'Dib, the, the desert mouse that we see briefly uh, on, where Paul has a little, uh, a little moment with? And I had never heard anything like this. Theo and I, at that time, were working on what those sounds might be and experimenting with guinea pigs and mice and little rodental kinds of sounds. And this sound was so beautiful and original uh, that we used it right out of the box. We, we, I called Danny Connor, who recorded it. Uh, she's a nature photographer. And she at first thought I was, this was a Halloween prank because she, he, here, here was a guy calling from Hollywood who wanted to use her nature sounds in a movie. And we proceeded to license it and put it in the movie just as it is. And you can look up Danny Connor, Red Squirrel, and you'll hear the desert mouse just as we have it in the movie. <laughs> Do you want to give a shout out to your sound team? I would love to uh, give a big thank you to Clint Bennett, who was our music editor and wrangled all of Hans's score and, and all those tracks uh the different versions of everything. And he was one of our brothers on the, on the mix stage. Uh, this team is very tight and Clint is part of that. And uh, we thank him for all his work. Yeah, I'd like to thank Lee Gilmore um, and Phil Barry, who are uh, both sound effects editors who work with us. Um, Lee Gilmore in the first part of the job and Phil Barry helped us when we all had to move our studios back home and um, work during the pandemic. Um, he, he helped us wrangle all of the different parts of the sound and keep everything in one place. And, uh, we, we had a, a terrific amount of help from those two guys. So I have to give them a shout. Uh, there's one, one more person would be Alan Meyerson who mixed the score, uh, for Hans, who did a fantastic job. I, I, I would be remiss if we left out Dave Whitehead, who did some lovely sound design, including, uh, the voice of the worm and, uh, the ornithopters, as well as, um, Greg Ten Bosch and Bob Kello and Chris Bonus, uh, our sound effects editors who are responsible for taking all this crazy stuff that Theo and I create and actually even fitting it to picture. And of course, um, Andy Malcolm of Footstep Studios in Toronto, who did such a marvelous job with the Foley. And Charlie. Charlie, Charlie Campagna yeah. for recording. Yeah, very microphones. Any closing thoughts? Make sure to see this film in a the theater. <laughs> Make sure to hear this film yeah. in the theater. What are you saying? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Theo. <laughs> it was so good yeah. to see all of you again. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. It was a pleasure. All right.